Hi, Adam. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Our guest today is Kalish Morrow from California. She is running for Hanford City Council and someone who I have had the pleasure of sharing a stage with several times in our uh, intersecting activism around the California Libertarian Party. And uh, just have seen her her presence now for for years. I mean, becoming, I don't know, is it is it too much to say a staple of the libertarian scene in California? But uh, Kalish uh-huh. running, for, running I, I, I want to say she's part of a wonderful community there around the Libertarian Party of California. And one of the ways we see this is in the support that she has. It is, is actually, I, I do want to, to start by commending and, and congratulating you and hoping, how, hoping that you appreciate as much as I do how unique it is that you have a, a California libertarian community behind you as a longtime, loyal, hardworking contributing to the team state activist or, or party activist now running for city council and just being a, a wonderful, positive, loving presence. You, you really do have a lot of good people behind you. It's been a lot of fun to see that. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of support from the party and it's a, it's been, it's been really humbling and, and inspiring too. And we really couldn't be putting on this campaign if it weren't for the support that I've gotten. You know, I'm still building up my name recognition in this town and I'm going against a pretty tough incumbent. She's been in office for quite some time and been in the local politics. So just building up my name recognition. And again, I've been, I have been an activist here in the community, but still just kind of getting there and getting that support. But the Libertarian Party has definitely given me a big boost. We we started the campaign pretty early on uh, last year, which is not something that you normally do, like in small office, which, but I mean, I feel that local office is probably one of the most important things that you can do anyway, because those are the your everyday life. That's your trash, your sewer, your water, your fire department, police, all that. Um, so we, we've got this grand idea of the, the presidency, like there, there's some sort of monarch, but really when you tailor it down, you've got, the, it's your city council and your county, um, board of supervisors that are really the ones that are making a big impact on your everyday life. But yeah, the, the Libertarian Party has definitely rallied behind me and helped me get a big jump start on this, um, on this campaign and get me all the resources I've needed. So it's been awesome. So is, why, why city council? And I mean, obviously you made the case for like why it's important, but why for you this race? And, and what are you enjoying about uh, connecting with the community like you described? Well, I actually got started with politics because I was a small business owner in our downtown. And I, I never saw myself as getting involved in politics, but being a business owner and then I got on like our our local main street organization too and I just started seeing how much the bureaucracy in town was really hurting our local business so I became more and more vocal and then became a bigger activist and just before you knew it um, back in 2016 was when I ran my first election or campaign and I, I really didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't involved in the party yet either. So, and the party, like California has come a long ways in a few years. So they weren't really pulled together to support a campaign like mine anyway. Um, so now here we are a few years later and I hemmed and hawed for a couple of years if I was going to run or not, or if we were just going to escape California altogether, uh, but decided to go ahead and, and make a go out of it uh, this year. And, you know, I think that, this year is probably going to be one of the most important elections that we've seen in a long time, just because of everything that's going on with COVID. And we're going to need more fiscal hawks on our council. We're going to need people who are not afraid to push back against our bureaucrats who have quite honestly been running the show for many, many years. We've had a very weak council for, for years. Uh, they've gotten a little bit more vocal and stuff, but yeah, they've been letting the bureaucrats run the show most for the most part. And that's been very concerning. All right. So speaking of which, tell us about your actual incumbent who you are challenging in this race. She, I, I know that she had been on school boards in the past. I think that's how she kind of got her start years and years ago. Uh, been involved in the community that way. And then she was on city council 
several years back and did her four years and decided not to run again. So she took like a four year break. That's when the race that she decided to jump back in was a race that I, I did. And yeah, you know, she, she's got a lot of name recognition. She, she didn't have to do too much uh, as far as campaigning was concerned. Somebody came and got her yard signs and everything. Cause she's already put in the work in the past to get her name out there. And yeah, she didn't, she didn't really have to do, do much to win in a four way race. <laughs> So it's definitely going to be a tough, uh, a tough race. But she, she's one that uh, I know a lot of people have had taken issue with some of her stances too. And uh, quite recently, she's been quoted a few times, just very much in support of letting staff do their work and you know just getting out of the way of staff, it basically giving the green light on bureaucracy, which is again very concerning. So how is Hanford, California? when it comes to COVID and masks? And I want to know general attitude, policy, but also for you campaigning, are, are you going door to door with a mask on? Yeah, the we're, we're not as bad as say LA or San Francisco as far as the, the, the fear is concerned. We, but you know, I've listened to you earlier, but it's still a majority though of people are super concerned about masks and and so um following Apollo's lead where he was out doing some canvassing in Wyoming and he was doing some testing as far as how was the reception with the voters when he went to go knock on their doors? Would they open the door? Would they talk to us even with or without out masks? So he kind of did some study groups as far as that was concerned. And he found that with the masks, the people were more willing to open up the door, more willing to talk to you. Uh, with the conservatives, the conservatives would usually just ask you to take off the mask and be like, oh, it's not a big deal. Or not that it's not a big deal, but we're okay. You can take it off. Yeah. So we have heard custom masks with my logo on it. We'll have my, my canvassers out there wearing them when they go up to the door. And if they feel comfortable and if the, the resident feels comfortable, then they'll just take them off. So what's city policy been? Has, has there been any, you, any, is, is Hanford doing anything unique in response to COVID? Not, not really. I was hoping that they would sign on to how Atwater and Kalinga has treated this. They very early on, they decided to name themselves business sanctuary cities. I thought you were going to say that they just declared themselves virus free zones because that's how they deal with guns in California, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, you would think that. The, I guess that's how they think it works. <laughs> So you were saying um, that they, they're sanctuary cities somehow, or that they did what what did you say they, they declared early on in, in the outbreak that they, they were gonna at least respect some economic rights? Yeah, so they declared themselves as sanctuary business san sanctuary cities and supported their businesses early, early on to not close up and to resist California from coming down, Sacramento from coming down on them and, and closing them up. So they, yeah, they, they can carried on being open and the, for the most part, from what I, from what I hear the city council members, they're saying that most of the business did remain open. So here it is. California is coming back to them saying, well, if you don't close up, we're going to keep COVID financial aid away from you. And it's kind of like, well, but we, we never closed. So we don't need it as much. I, I'm sure that they're still <laughs> taking a hit to a certain extent, but yeah, it's very, very coercive measures going on in this state, and it's it's mind numbing. It really is. So, as a direction for what you'd want to see for for Hanford for California, you know, as, as a member of the city council, what would be your priority? The priority right now would definitely be taking back control from our bureaucrats, making sure that we aren't going to be raising any fees or any taxes on our on our community. As you know, the government wants to put itself first above anybody else. And even though the rest of the people are hurting, they really only care about how their bottom line is feeling. So they're going to, I, you know, I already foresee it. I, I see it likely happening all across California and our cities, too. We're really one of the things, too, that we have to worry about is CalPERS and how that's bankrupting cities after cities and just how we're having to restructure our departments, too. Yeah. 
for for people who aren't California residents or former California residents who happen to work at the Rose Institute of State and Local Government when I was in college, who knows what CalPERS is? You, you, please give us the acronym and why, as the pension fiscal cliff, this is such a critical issue for California. Ooh. The uh, the actual acronym is eluding me. It's uh, the pension uh, pension retirement plan. Basically, is what it is, though. So California has this just huge pension issue, and we're underfunded. It, instead of doing a, your traditional five hundred one k, which can kind of adjust to the the economy, we are guaranteeing that you're going to get X amount of dollars and all this stuff. And it's basically going underfunded and we, it's going to bankrupt everybody. And people have this idea of like, well, if you do a 501k or 401k and you're going to, you know, your retirement can fluctuate. This at least you get, you for sure have a certain amount of money that's going to be in your retirement. Well, that's not the case if the city bankrupts and they can get out of CalPERS basically. So then you're left with nothing. And that's a big concern for, for our community. The fiscal cliff that, I mean, this is something that we saw in California back when I was going to college in the early 2000s. I mean, I graduated college in 2005, 15 plus years ago. This was a huge problem for California. And if you step back and go, yeah, the government overpromised what it could deliver in retirement benefits. And, and as a libertarian, you want to look at this and go, well, they promised to steal from me as a taxpayer. They promised to steal from my kids in the future to pay for stuff they never had a say in so that you can double dip in your retirement and you can live like a king because you worked for the city for 20 years pushing a pencil behind a desk like and it's and, and that that starts to get at how bad this is but it's worse when you think of how the people trying to get those pensions are the victims here as well because it was government actually lying to them also saying yeah that we can steal from people enough to support this and you should depend on this for your retirement and it, it set up this horrific conflict now between retired government employees in California and everybody else who pays taxes in California, right? Yeah, and then what makes it even worse too is the people who are collecting on retirement and CalPERS, they end up moving out of the state because they want to avoid the income tax. So they, they flee the state, they're going to Idaho or Texas or anywhere else where the quality of life is a little bit more affordable. So we're, we're losing, we're losing our residents. They just hightail it out of here. And I, yeah, the, <laughs> it's just a big mess in it. We need some good uh, good reform happening here soon. Are you trying to tell me that government is that great illusion by which everybody tries to live at the expense of everybody else? Yeah, I think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Kalish, I, I want to you know I want to go back to COVID because I love talking about viruses and it's my favorite thing in the world. No, it is <laughs> it's, it is a sort of unavoidable dark cloud over everything right now, obviously. And you know, as as your biography says, you know, you're a full time interior designer working out of your home while raising two young homeschooled sons. And and I, and I got to hand it to you, you know, when when people say being a mother is the hardest job in the world, I'm like, well. Then why cop out and send your kids to a government-run school where they're going to be propagandized and conditioned and unmothered? And I, I don't know, I, whatever you, you give them as love as a mother is going to be beaten out of them. Like, no, it's not what you're doing is, is really to be commended. And, you know, as someone who, you know, I want to put my, myself in the shoes of the average American right now who's going, crap, I just lost my job or crap, my income just went way down crap, now I'm stuck at home and I don't know what to do. Crap, now I got to homeschool my kids on top of this. Crap. And they look at you and go, man, why she got it so good over there? She's already working from home. And, and I assume, you know, and, and I want to, you know, want to know your take up or your experience with this, but I, I would assume that being a you know full time working from home interior designer, you, you at least can still manage to keep some business, I, I hope, despite COVID, you're not getting fired or forced to wear a mask on, on the job. 
but yeah, how how does that relate? And and do you do you you know do you feel weird campaigning? I mean, because you could be walking around Hanford going, <laughs> "I told you so." <laughs> I told you so. You should have been now. You see, <laughs> I told you so. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of bragging on your behalf so that you don't have to sound like a jerk like that to your constituents, <laughs> but they can learn a thing or two from you, especially in this crisis and the contrast of, of your lifestyle compared to the average that gives you a huge advantage, right? Yeah. It, you know, what's interesting though, is I, I, I was working for an e-design company for a little while and it just wasn't panning out very well. It, the, you, it wasn't worth the, the let the little bit of money that I was actually making and stuff. And my husband actually makes really great money. So when I said, I just need a break. So I, I basically put myself on a sabbatical, which was actually good timing because I don't know if you've heard of AB5 here in California. AB5 was basically, it's the uh, it was legislation that basically got rid of gig work. So if you were a um, when I, um, a private contractor, uh, you would then have to. It, it just screwed everything up. And this was really about like Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. But then it got into freelance journalists and salons and all of these different crazy things. And oops, sorry, phone call. <laughs> Somebody's trying to interrupt my interview. So, um, but yeah, in, in my job, because I was a private contractor, fell under AB5. So it was good timing that I was already wanting to get out of that job because California was going to kill it for me anyway. Um, so for the past year, I've kind of put myself on a sabbatical so I can sit down and we'll work on our own heart house projects for once, but also to start reading all the books, start talking to all the peoples, getting some mentors so I could be really the best I could be for, for city council and be as knowledgeable as possible. Uh, but yeah, when it when COVID hit, because my, my husband does work from home or he works on base sometimes, uh, he's a flight officer, a naval systems flight officer uh, at NAS Lamar. And we are, we homeschool, like it really didn't change that much as far as like our day to day lives. But it was taking a toll, though, we, as much as people think that homeschooling means your kids are unsocialized and whatnot they actually got to go out and see a lot of friends. We had them in various activities. They went to the art center here and would take art classes. So they were really active and it's definitely taken a toll on them. And, uh, and with that too, having people like you're saying, being like, wait, you've got it kind of all together. Can you help me out here? So I put together a Facebook group with friends from that are both local and up and down the state. I have other people that are out of the state too that are part of this group, just so we can kind of share some resources. Because we're kind of more like unschool method too. We've got the kids' tablets and all these different learning games and workbooks and all that. And the kids just get to enjoy the subjects that they really want to get into. And we just kind of help facilitate that learning. And I've been trying to okay. share that with other people because it's a very so low stress would you say that's the critical difference between homeschooling and unschooling that homeschooling is just a curriculum at home and, and unschooling is self-guided learning? Yeah. So with homeschooling, cause we were part of a homeschooling program. They would send us a curriculum and the books and, and those kinds of things to help us along. But I was feeling that we were, we were still being stifled. My kids were having to do just a ton of math. We couldn't do any science or, you know, it, it would be a very short time frame that we could fit it in, but it was just not, it, it was still killing creativity too. And I just decided to scrap that. And I looked more into the homeschool method and I've heard some great success stories. And, and the thing too with, uh, with unschooling is as long as you have like that supportive base, you know, uh, have both parents that are really involved and, and excited about it, that's where you get the best turnout with your with your kids but yeah they my my little one my oldest he loves space and science and stuff and he can tell you all about the international space system and what elon musk has done and where we're going and mars and like all of the different steps and everything he's just so into it and he loves it 
Uh, and then my younger one too, he's just this very creative little we call him critter, but he's just this little wild man. But he get he gets to enjoy more art type projects or more sports, those kinds of things that are, you know, that so they get to excel in the things that they're good at and not be beaten down about the things that they're not that great about. Yeah, I want to get into this a little bit more with you and, and bring it back to your campaign and, and why this is relevant to the general public right now. Because it's not just hey, libertarians geeking out on government schools are bad, find an alternative, right? Right now, it is a unique historical phenomena where, I mean, I, I would wager, I, I, I think, never before in human history have there been so many children in institutional education suddenly taken out of it and sort of you know, forced into homeschooling. And a lot of libertarians like myself have said, Oh, this is a silver lining of the pandemic where parents are going like homeschool or else. And they go, OK, uh, I'll do what I can. Oh, what do you know? I can do this. You know, and there's there's that positiveness to it. But there's also, well, this isn't really a good example of unschooling or homeschooling, even when it's homeschooling under the cloud of Corona. And you can't get that socialization that is that is so critical for for child development that you you are able to do uh, what I would say is better you know in, in homeschooling or unschooling when you can let the child decide if his social interaction is appropriate rather than send him down a hallway full of bullies or or who knows what else you know they're going to be forced into a, you know an associations against their will at a government school so to the general challenge of you know people raised against homeschooling or unschooling. Um, and, and I suppose I use the term homeschooling to include, you know, unschooling as a sort of methodology within unschooling, you know, the fair use of the terminology, right? Um, yeah. But that, you know, right now, uh, w w what would you what would you want to tell other parents uh, throughout the country who are experiencing homeschooling for the first time, and uh, you know, about socialization? How would you support that, you know, right now with, with COVID as it is? Well, my first thought is to tell them to to stop panicking. You know, don't don't worry. Stop freaking out. Everybody's so stressed out. You're stressing your kids out about it, too, because they're, you know, if they're, they're missing a few weeks or even a few months. They're not going to become degenerates and unlearned individuals they're going to be fine and in fact the one of the methods for unschooling is if you have a kid that has been going to, to institutional schooling you do a, a time period what they call de-schooling so it's almost like just taking a break and that could be the same thing as like your, your summer break and some kids only need a few weeks other kids need a few months just to kind of unwind from the stress and the pressure that normal school has put on them. I have a lot of friends that were saying, you know, they, they've got very small children and their kids are coming home stressed. They have, they're, they're doing all these standardized testing all the time and they're supposed to be hitting these marks and the recesses are getting decreased and lunch and just all of these crazy things. And so the kids are stressed and they're getting put on Ritalin and these amphetamines to make them more compliant. You got very intelligent children who are just being children and you're giving them medications to alter that mind chemistry. And it's going, it's, it's kept escalating across the board over the last couple decades. And it's really just to calm them down, make them more compliant. And it's awful. And we sit here and wonder why we have mental health issues in the U.S. Well, you're starting them off. The average age is six years old to start them on amphetamines. It's in. It's insane. I I really don't subscribe. That's to the, the average age. Well, hold on, hold on. That's the average. That's the average age for starting kids on the amphetamine class of ADHD, ADD medications in the United States. Six. Yep. So they're yep. starting kids on it a lot younger than six. Oh yeah, they're starting them on at about four years old. And yeah, it's heartbreaking. Uh, it, and so you just see how bad the institution has gotten even since we were kids. The ADHD was one of those things that was just kind of coming about and now it's it's blown up and everybody has ADHD. And when I listened to their stories, I was like, well, I guess I technically had ADHD, but <laughs> I, I'd be damned if I was to be put on some medications that would be altering my my state of mind. 
And so, and it's, it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just that it's the, it, and I've studied this on the individual case basis, but I didn't know it was this bad. Now I thought, I thought at this point, I mean, this is kind of like an old trope, like, you know, 22 veterans commit suicide a day. And you go, well, we've been ignoring that for so long. We can ignore it a little longer, right? And it's really, though, like, this is, we know that you give a kid amphetamines, you're going to create long-term mental health issues. You're going to be fucking with their sleep. You're, you're going to be, you know, messing with their ability to interact with their peers. You're going to be messing with so their, their ability to, to do so many other things. We're still doing this? Yeah, at an alarming rate, too. And I think that it's also not just the, the mind-altering drugs, but just that loss in confidence. And and almost like a, I hate to use the word cop-out, but in a way it ends up being a cop. You know, it's an excuse. Oh, well, well, I don't have to pay attention as much because I have this condition. I, I literally have ADHD. And I think those are usually the, the type of people where they ask you a question and before you can even answer it, they're, they're jumping around to something else. I think that they've never really had to sit down and learn to focus and listen to people because they've just always been given an excuse. And I don't, I don't want to fault them on it or anything and, you know, bag on anybody like that. But I see it a lot and I, I can't help but think that it was because how we've been brought up and the the medications and these kinds of kinds of things it's just made people it, it's it's a mess yeah um, i'm not but yeah, i'm not so be able to, get to them. point out that it that it's a cop out for the kids as it is for the parents oh you screwed up at parenting oh, don't worry we have a pill for that <laughs> there you go <laughs> i mean i i don't want to like again I, I, I want to get away from, you know, blaming and victimization and, you know, well, do you, can you blame the parent? Well, if it's the parent and the kids screwing up, yeah, you, you blame the parent. The parent's the responsible one. And as, as, a, as a, this is one of the reasons, you know, I'm afraid to have kids myself is that having a kid in, in America today means that, you know, if, if, you're, if your neighbors see that you're smoking pot and don't like you, they call CPS and your kids get taken away. You know, there, there's so many challenges. It's scary. And I, I, I kind of want to, like, fix the state of, you know, policy-wise, what we do as, as parenting in America before I have kids. And I think there are a lot of people who feel that way, too. And, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm ready. You know, I fi finally put the ring on, as you know. You were here. It was awesome to have that, yeah, uh, that event of defiance. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate so many people coming out in defiance for that. And now it's, it feels like in order to have kids with love, with, with the love that children deserve, with the attention that they deserve, with the forgiveness and, and support and, and flexibility that they deserve, the nurturing of their creativity that they deserve, we are robbing them of that by sending them to government schools today and doing the typical American parenting thing of behavioral problems, let's let's hit them with drugs. And the whole concept of schools as prisons or government subsidized babysitting centers. And you know, just I I I want to grab American parents by the collar and say, so that you can keep up with the Joneses? Really? So that you can work your nine to five? So that you can have this backwards race of a commute sitting in traffic for an hour in, in L.A. going both ways. And this backwards race to see who can get to their shittier job fastest. So it's, it, and to, to do that, you're going to put your kids in a government-run school because you can't put in the effort to give them the love that they deserve as a parent. And you go, wow, shit. <sighs> that explains. I, I, I don't I know that's not the rant that America needs right now, but it's the rant that American parents deserve. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think it's so unfortunate too. I, I was just thinking about if we were to completely defund the whole school system, where we're spending about twelve thousand dollars a year, at least in California, it might be even more now per student per year. That's <sighs> $24,000 a year that could be going right into our own pockets, or at least like, you know, the pockets of, of parents. 
but we don't even need that much. There are resource centers that run. Uh, I think that there's one up in Placerville, Roseville, anyway, uh, Northern California, and they're a resource center that that fosters the whole unschool mindset. And they, they pay like six or seven thousand dollars a year in that tuition. But even with that, if we were to get the, that stipend or something to help offset that cost, they're going to better educational system anyway. There's flexibility and it's not institutionalization. And you're still getting some of that babysitting type stuff too, but it's at a fraction of the cost of what it is to put them in what has basically become a broken system. And I don't, I don't even want to, I'm not going to place any blame on our teachers because I know how frustrated our teachers are too. And, it, and I know how frustrated they are when I first went to them years ago saying, I want to homeschool my kids. You're a teacher. What do you say about that? And they're like, do it. Just do it. It, it. It's so messed up. We can't we can't do what we what we want to do. We can't tailor to the children as well as we want. We, we've been taking away our own uh, voice and creativity. And if you have the ability to homeschool, then then do it. And that was really wow. eye opening. Wow. So I'm pretty sure that by now, every libertarian watching, given given how good you are at winning support from libertarians, is is understanding that this is an important race for the party for 2020, and that uh, among our entire wonderful party wide stable of candidates, I guess you're in the <laughs> stable of candidates because I know if you don't win, you're going to come back. In, in supporting <laughs> Kalish is a long term investment in the party. Am I right? You're not here Absolutely. for someone who just happens to be running as a libertarian. You are dedicated to the party and the cause and, and therefore uniquely deserving of the support of your fellow libertarians. Our, our, it's if I may collectivize, our, our fellow libertarians. <laughs> but but I, I also want to, I want to grab the, uh, you know, the, 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 the residents of Hanford, California and go, oh, like this woman, but learn <laughs> from her, follow this, you know, and, and I, I I leave it to people with a greater sense of diplomacy like yourself to carry that message <laughs> to the people of Hanford. So I, I hope you're able to do that. And, and I hope that, you know, even this interview uh, is something that gets out, not just to, uh, you know, libertarian activists who can appreciate what you're doing as a candidate and, and people who would donate to you because you're uh, a libertarian candidate worthy of support, but that to the people of Hanford, that they get to see, you know, uh, you know a little bit about what's behind this and, and who's really behind you. Uh, you know, sometimes people are suspicious of libertarian candidates who get support mm -hmm. from, you know, outside of their localities. But, you know, why are we supporting Kalish? You know, we, we love her message. We love what she represents. And we know that the people of, of Hanford, I would say, from, from what we've seen of the reception of your campaign so far, are also uniquely receptive to a, a compassionate message of, of truth and freedom and practical local policy that, that you bring to this race. So Kalish, I'll just give you the chance to please take the last word, anything you would wanna say to uh, potential supporters, constituents. And uh, I, I wanna point out, so CJ gets this up on screen while you're talking here. The website is moro4hanford.us. That's M-O-R-R-O-W, the letter, excuse me, the number, I know the difference between numbers and letters. The number <laughs> four, Hanford, H-A-N-F-O-R-D, dot us check it out uh so kalish your last thoughts please um last thoughts well i i love this town i wasn't sure if i would love this town i'm a transplant from southern california and when i first came up here it was just flatlands but i went and saw the our downtown we've got this beautiful historic downtown that that has been lacking some vision for a long time and the because of that attraction to the town, I have been able to network and connect with the people here and they just have such great spirit. And I've fought beside them on many issues, uh, spoke up for them. And I can only hope that when I get elected that I have that opportunity to be an amplified voice for the people for a change since they have been denied their, denied the ear of the city for so long. So I appreciate all the support that I've been getting and I I'm ready to pound the pavement and earn the votes and get into council and make the changes that we we need to see. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us, Kalish.